So today, that's <laughs> booming. <laughs> if you weren't all awake, you are now. Richard Raw says, a good journey begins with knowing where we are and being willing to go somewhere else. So where are we on our journey in developing a rule of life? We have had the diagnosis. We've looked at Jesus' invitation. Today we look at silence and solitude. Next week we look at the desert. Then we look at Sabbath. And lastly, simplicity and slowing. So the first two have sort of been about diagnosing the problem and then looking at what Je- how Jesus invites us in to a different way of life. The next four weeks, starting today, are about looking at ways to actually go about doing that and practices to unhurry. So just so you know, where we are on this journey, that's where we are. Last week, of course, we explored um, Jesus' invitation of come to me all who are weary. Get rest. Recover yourself. Find yourself again. Discover the natural rhythms of grace was how the message translated it. So today we're looking at the spiritual discipline and practice of silence and solitude. Too often, I think these two disciplines are overlooked as not necessary. Because, if we, but if we actually look at the scriptures, they are incredibly important disciplines for us to develop. That's why we had two readings this morning. One, Elijah, it's well known. He was expecting to see God in the big, but he heard God in the quiet whisper when everything had gone. And secondly, Jesus, Jesus himself withdrew up to places alone and prayed. And there's a few more references in as we go through. Next week, Linda's going to be exploring the desert and seeing it as a place of hope and encouragement and not somewhere to look at with fear. Now, silence and solitude does happen in the desert, of course. But th- this week, it's about learning to find space in the everyday for silence and solitude with Jesus. Now, some of you might be sat there thinking, but silence, I hate the silence. I can't stand it when it goes silent. I just want to say to you, let's bear with it and go with it because I am sure that you will receive from God in the silence. The journey of being a human is not easy. I'm sure we can all agree with that. Instinctively, we tune in to the loudest noise that is around us. If I'm at home working in my study and I hear Joseph crying, I instinctively tune into it. If we're in church and you can hear lots of noise going on, you instinctively tune in to the loudest noise. You try and focus on who you're speaking with or listening at the front, but if something happens, we focus on the other noise because it's not what we expect. It's very easy to get distracted by the noise that is all around us. Therefore, I think in the, in the present day, silence and solitude is actually far more important because of how noisy our world is. And I, it's a beautiful gift that I don't think we take seriously enough. Now, I'm not, Jesus withdrew to lonely places, as we said, but how often do we withdraw to lonely places, physically or metaphorically? I'm not saying now that we all need to start disappearing off on our own and become like the church fathers and become hermits sitting on a plinth for years and years and years on end listening to God. I'm not saying that. It's about finding a rhythm that works for us. And that will be different for each of us here. As we've explored over the last two weeks, we're easily distracted in the modern world. And too often, we miss out on what God is actually doing. That was why I wanted to share, to get you, encourage you, to share what God has been doing in your lives this week. Because we've probably had a busy week. But God has still been at work. God has been with you every moment of every day. Whether you were awake or asleep, whether you were at work or at home, Whatever you were doing, God was right there with you. How many times have you heard from God this week? I'm not going to go around and ask, but how many times have you heard from God this week in the busyness and noisiness of the modern world? Now, the book, When Church Stops Working, which is the second book that I've been looking at, is one of the, is one of the two that I've based this series on. It talks of this like a traffic jam. 
Perhaps if you're like me, confession time, more often than not, when you get into a traffic jam, you get cross. The anger creeps up of, oh, I need to get somewhere. Why now? Why is it always this road? Why can't people just drive properly? Why is everybody else foolish? I just need to get there. I told you it was being confessional. I start watching the clock. And I watch it tick by and think, I'm going to be so late now. And it's even worse when you have a sat-nav on and it has your, desti- your time to a destination and you watch that go up and up and up and up. And you think, right, that 10 o'clock meeting, I'm not going to be there till half 10 now. How do I ring through and let them know without touching my mobile because it's illegal? And then I start getting in a, in a massive panic. There is nothing more disheartening. But... What if we look at it another way? When we are stopped in a traffic jam, how often do we see it as a blessing? This is a challenge for me, friends. This is a challenge. Perhaps when you're in the car, you have the radio playing, or you're listening to an audio book, or you've got music on. We don't get the silence and solitude in the car. What if, though, when we get stuck in a traffic jam, We don't worry about how late we'll be, but we see it as a blessing. There is a reason why I'm talking about traffic jams, don't worry. Rather than snapping at our loved ones in the car, let's take the time to have a conversation and communicate with one another in that moment. More often than not, Amanda and I will have deep conversations in the car because we're there, we can't go anywhere, and we have those heart-to-hearts with one another. But in the traffic jam... We may be desperate to get somewhere. Have you ever thought about the stories of the people around you? Not in the car with you, but in the other cars around you. We may be desperate to get there, but what about the person in the car on the left who may be hoping and praying that the traffic jam stays like it is for at least another hour because they don't want to go home because they're going to have to pick up the argument that they had with their loved one before they left for work. They may be going, I want this traffic jam to stay as long as I can. In the traffic jam, we have to simply sit and wait. But think about the stories of those around you. Now, ironically, I think God's having a laugh with me. This week, I've been stuck in more traffic jams than normal. And I think it's because he knew what I was going to be saying this morning, or at least what he told me to say. And I've really tried my hardest not to get angry or frustrated. On Friday, I'd taken the kids up to Woodside Farm, and I was coming back on Telford Way. I think it's Telford Way. And I got stuck in a traffic jam. And I thought, right, no, I'm not going to get angry. Hannah was crying in the back because she was really hungry, and there's nothing I could do in the car. And I thought, no, I'm not going to get angry. And I just looked around, and I caught the eyes of somebody who was, who was looking over my way, and we just acknowledged each other. Just that moment when we just sort of nodded and, and grinned at each other, because we were both stuck, both ways, we were stuck. I have no idea who he was, probably never see him again. But I really tried hard to think this, I need to be, this needs to be a blessing for me. It doesn't matter what time I get home, I've got nothing else on. So, That's the traffic jam, stuck in a traffic jam, and we use it as a blessing. What if we now apply that logic to the church? Stuck in the church. Back in week one of this series, we stopped and we waited at the end of the talk. We waited on God. Now, in the church, we are very good at rushing things. We're not very good at silence. We're not very good at taking a long time We rush things through. As soon as there's a moment of silence, we're straight into the next thing. Straight at the end of the song. Steve, do the reading. Then Tim, you're going to preach. Then David, he's going to pray. Then we're going to have a next song. Then we're going to have tea and coffee. Then we're going to go home. Then we're going to have lunch. Then we're going to watch TV or whatever we're going to do this afternoon. In the church, we are not very good at stopping and waiting and not very good at silence. So, the traffic jam. What if we learn to wait in church? What if we learn to wait for God in church? Rather than us rushing through, we stop and we wait for God. Because God shows up 
every time his people meet. God is here now. Have we been too busy or distracted with the noise to hear God at work today? Have we been like Elijah looking in the wrong places? But God is in that quiet whisper in the church. Or are we too busy and hurried to realize? Now waiting for the church is biblical. We're going to have a quick, very brief look at some verses in Acts. The early church's first command was not to rush around and do everything and bring many Gentiles to Christ. That wasn't the first command that the church was given. What's the first command to the church? It's to wait. As Jesus was about to ascend, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. Wait for the gift my father has promised. What happens? Our wonderful friend Peter struggles with that command. He struggles with the waiting. Because Peter, in his wisdom, jumps straight in to church admin. And he looks to appoint a 12th apostle. It's necessary to choose one of the men who've been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us. He wants to jump straight in and replace Judas. What happens next? The disciples nominate two men. And they cast lots. And the lot falls to Matthias. What else happens with Matthias? How much more do we hear about him in Scripture? Nothing. We don't hear anything else about Matthias. Jesus said to wait. Now, if we wait a bit longer and move further into Acts, who do we meet? We meet Saul of Tarsus. Saul has a blinding experience on the road to Damascus, and then he has to wait. He has to wait for Ananias to go to him so that his eyes can be opened. And once they are opened, he be, well, he's changed his name to Paul, and he goes on to do wonderful work for the Lord. How much do we hear about Paul, friends? Plenty, thank you. We hear a heck of a lot about Paul, and indeed, he wrote a lot of the books that we read in our Bible today. Why? Because that's the apostle that God chose it wasn't the apostle that was ca- they cast lots for, Vegas style. It was the disciple and the apostle that God chose because he had said, wait. So in the traffic jam, if we are waiting, it might actually be a blessing because God might be about to speak and say something to us and it's how he's going to get our attention. We, especially in the Church of England, love our admin. We love it. There's loads of it to do all the time. Even the slightest bit of, the, you know, the, well, perhaps not quite the pens, but when we bring something into the church, we have to record it in a book. If something leaves the church, we have to record it in a book. We have to do all sorts of admin in terms of safeguarding. The piles of paper are like this. We have to do admin in terms of rotors. We have to do admin in terms of uh, printer copying and how much we pay for the printer and Brendan has a, and Juliet are probably buried under mounds and mounds and mounds of receipts each year because of all that we spend in the church. And then all that needs to go to the accountant, and then the accountant needs to send it back. There is loads and loads of admin. And if I'm not careful, I can be sucked up into all the admin and spend all of my time doing that rather than actually being out in the community, which is what I've been called to do. It is what we are called to do as the church, me and you. It's not just me that's out in the community. We are all out in the community. I'm not very good at admin either. I'll hold my hand up. I get by with what I need to do, but that's about it. So what if the church needs another wake-up call to become more like the early church and to wait on God and not rush ahead with the admin like Peter did? Perhaps the revival that we are so desperate to see in this nation has not yet happened because we are too busy and we have not spent time alone with God. 
the rule of life that we've started exploring about unhurrying and becoming more like Jesus means that we need to get better at some of the spiritual disciplines that come with it. My mind is usually quite busy with all sorts of ideas. Steve and Wendy will tell you that. It's like running at 100 miles an hour is what they said to me. The archdeacon said the same to me. He said, why don't you try slowing down to 70 miles an hour and see what happens? That's what this series has been. That's what I was convicted with when I started reading this book, to slow down. It'd be more economical if we go back to the traffic jam, if we slow down. It's more economical on our fuel, less wear and tear. It would mean a much more natural pace of life. I've still got a lot of work to do on that one, trust me. How busy do we feel, though, with all that's going on in life? If we start to practice these disciplines of silence and solitude, perhaps we would start to slow down and learn the rhythms of grace we explored last week. I want you to come with me back to the 1990s now. There used to be something that happened in the 1990s which doesn't happen anymore. What do you think that is? I'll tell you. Boredom. We used to get bored. We don't get bored anymore because we are saturated with so much entertainment right at our fingertips, right in our pockets, right on the screen in front of us. When was the last time you felt bored? Perhaps it was a long time ago. A recent survey showed that 77% of individuals will reach for their phone when they have nothing else to distract their attention. Now, that was from May 2015. We're eight years later now. I imagine that figure has gone up. What do we do when we are distracted or we've got nothing else to do? We take a phone out and we start looking at things. Do you remember a life before a mobile phone or a tablet? When we used to actually read books. We used to sit on the train and look out of the window. Shock horror. We used to talk to people. Good grief. Standing in the queue for a coffee shop, sitting at the bus stop. I used to have great conversations. When I was at uni, even in, two, in the early 2000s, I used to love, I was working at Tesco at the time to help fund, the, fund my student, uh, on top of the student loan. I used to love it when I left the, the shop. It was always the same bus driver, and I used to stand at the front with him. I know you're not supposed to do this, but he told me I could. I used to stand at the front with him, and we just used to have a chat on the way home, because it was only usually me and him on the bus. When was the last time we chatted to a bus driver? Nowadays, in many ways, the only place that we are alone with our own thoughts is in the shower. Unless, unless, <laughs> unless you have a device that's waterproof. <laughs> Amanda and I have a waterproof Bluetooth speaker in the shower. It's not often used, I must admit now, because actually I, I've been convicted of it. Why all this, though? Well, John Mark Homer talks about it as being the new normal of hurried digital distraction is robbing us of the ability to be present. And I think he's absolutely right. We are so distracted that we are unable to just simply be present with one another, to sit and have a, ch a conversation with one another. Now, interestingly, the article that I just quoted from, the 77%, is called, Our Memories Are Now Worse Than Goldfish. It's true. We don't have to retain the information anymore. What, what, what's that verse, Tim? Well, I get my phone out and go quickly Google it. We don't know our Bibles because we just turn them, well, if you're like me, you turn it on. You go to the bit you need and then you carry on. Whereas when you're using a book, you can actually see, well, this is where it fits in, the, in, in Scripture. This is what comes before. This is what comes after. The digital, distract, the digital distraction is robbing us of the ability to be present. Indeed, Ronald, oh, I've gone to the wrong one, sorry. Um, Ronald Rollheiser, who's a Catholic priest and social, uh, social observer, says we are distracting ourselves into spiritual oblivion. That's hard to hear. That we are so distracted, we are going into spiritual oblivion. In the reading from Luke, we heard that Jesus retreated to the lonely place. It's not the only time he did that. 
In Matthew's gospel, immediately after his baptism, he's guided by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days. We know the story well. The Greek translation of the word wilderness can mean a whole variety of things. Desert, deserted place, desolate place, solitary place, lonely place. The list goes on. The wilderness that Jesus goes to is not a place of weakness, but is a training ground. A place of hope and a place of preparation. And don't worry, Linda, more on that next week. I'm stopping there. But essentially, Jesus takes time out to retreat and be on his own with his Father. Another example from the Gospels is Mark 1. We read of Jesus as the Messiah and all the things that he's done. And Mark's Gospel is, and immediately, and immediately, and immediately, there's a fast pace to it. But what happens at the end of the day? Jesus must have been exhausted. You'd think he'd lay down, put his feet up, perhaps have a leisurely morning, watch whatever, well, they didn't have a TV, did they? But, you know, perhaps go outside and watch nature, watch the sunrise. But no, what do we find in Mark 1.35? Early in the morning, he gets up and goes to the solitary place where he prayed. Mark 1.35. Later in Mark 6, 45 to 46, we read of Jesus taking time away on his own up the mountainside. Are we getting the picture yet? Jesus retreats to spend time alone with God. Do we? Why don't we practice silence and solitude? We're too busy. Simple as. What do we mean by silence? We mean both internal and external. The external is obvious. You turn off the TV, you turn off the radio, you put down the book, you don't use your headphones when you're out and about. That type of silence is something we have to create. Even the great church father, St. Augustine, says, entering into silence is entering into joy. In the Screwtape Letters, the senior demon Screwtape says, the devil's kingdom is one of noise, and we will make the whole universe a noise in the end. So what about internal silence, though? How do we quiet that voice in our mind? Because after all, there is no off switch. But silence in the capacity that Jesus speaks of is when we are able to do both, switching off the external and switching off the internal. We're not very good when we're left to our own thoughts. It's getting harder and harder in the modern age due to the noise all around us. When I was on retreat the other week, it was the first time in a long time that I had spent time alone with God. I was able to silence my inner voice and be very deliberate in not filling my time up so I had a chance to listen. As we heard in the reading from 1 Kings, Elijah was expecting to hear God in the loud, but it's in the calm afterwards. How often are we too focused on what's going on around us that we can't hear what God is saying? How often are we more like Peter and rushing to do the admin and getting things in order rather than waiting on God? Very briefly, solitude. It is not the same as isolation. I want to be very clear on that. It is not the same as isolation. That's quite small. Solitude is engagement. Isolation is escape. Solitude is safety. Isolation is danger. Solitude is how we open ourselves up to God Isolation is painting a target on our back for the tempter. I will send you these slides around later. Richard Foster, who wrote The Celebration of Discipline, says this, Loneliness is inner emptiness, but solitude is inner fulfillment. So we need to make sure that we don't get it the wrong way around. When we come to church, we often do so with the mindset of wanting to experience and encounter God. But we soon leave and we go back out to the secular wasteland, as John Mark Comer calls it, how many of us would admit right now that perhaps we don't feel as close to God as we would like to because we've been too busy? In our earthly relationships, we have to spend time with each other to foster our relationships. If I didn't spend enough time with Amanda, our marriage would suffer. So why do we think that not spending enough time with God is going to lead to the same thing? Our relationship with him suffers if we don't spend the time with him. So where are we with silence and solitude? Do we think it doesn't matter to us? That we can carry on as we are doing? I think we need to take a long, hard look at our lives and see whether our priorities are right. Otherwise, we may find ourselves slowly drifting away from God and only thinking about him when we go to church. This afternoon, I'm going to email you this workbook which is a companion to the book, How to Unhurry. It has some suggested practices. You might like to try them. 
I'll send you the link to the website because there's videos with John Mark Homer explaining some of those disciplines. If it's helpful, great. If it's not, that's fine too. We're now going to watch a video. And the video is silent. We're going to have to read what the video says. Or you can just take the time to be silent with God. And then we're going to listen to a song. And as we get to the song, I'm not going to ask you to sing it. I just want to encourage you to allow the words to be sung over you. You might like to stand and open your hands. You might like to sit. You might like to kneel. You might like to lie down. Whatever you need to do to spend time with God this morning.